As this is New Year's Eve, I must confess that I'm amazed how quickly another year has passed by. Would you not agree? You know, as James 4 tells us that our lives are, are like a vapor that are here for just a little while and then they quickly vanish away. Or as Moses states in Psalm 90, our days are short like our sleep or like the grass which grows up and soon withers. Even if it's 70 or 80 years, our lives are soon cut off and we fly away. And this is why as believers in Jesus Christ, we must redeem the time by abiding in Christ and investing in eternal matters, for life is short and the days are evil. And one day we're going home to the Father's house in glory, either by death or by rapture, and it could be in 2018. So how was 2017? For you? Was it a good year? Now, if you're thinking biblically, you're going to ask in return, well, a good year in what area? Circumstantially? Materially? Medically? Relationally? And while all of these have a place, the real issue, first and foremost, is spiritually. How was 2017 spiritually? Did you walk consistently in fellowship with the Lord? Did you capture opportunities to proclaim the praises of Him who saved you by His amazing grace? Was 2017 filled with godly works that one day will be evaluated as gold, silver, and precious stones? Or, or was it hay, wood, and straw? Did you become more and more like Jesus Christ this past year through the transforming power of the Spirit of God using the Word of God as you beheld Jesus Christ in the Word of God? Did you experience definite answers to specific prayers. Did you serve Jesus Christ and in doing so serve others as unto the Lord? Did you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Did God use you in any way to bring anyone else to Jesus Christ? Was 2017 largely worthwhile or was it largely wasted? Was it live for the glory of God or for the glory of self? Did you serve in humility? Or did you expect to be served due to pride? Now, whatever was done in 2017, dear saint, is done. It's over. It cannot be recaptured. And as Paul said in Philippians 3, Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, like in 2018. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So it's fitting for me on New Year's Eve to ask a very critical and crucial question we do well to think deeply about. It's not... Who will get married in 2018? It's not, will DBC run out of money in 2018? It's not, will the Gibbs students survive another year in 2018? It's not, who's going to die in 2018? Now, I believe that God's greatest concern for you and me and DBC in 2018 is this. Have you left your first love? And to observe this from the scriptures, I invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. For this very question and this very issue is at the heart of of what our Lord Jesus Christ 
says to the church at Ephesus, we begin in verse 1. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now you've heard me say before that a text without a context is a pretext. So let's put this passage into its context. We actually have in Revelation chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, the inspired outline of the book of Revelation. If you look back just at the two verses before chapter 2, we read this. Write the things which you have seen. That's chapter 1. The things which are, that's going to be chapter 2 and 3. And the things which will take place after this, chapter 4 and following. In fact, that's exactly how chapter 4, verse 1 begins. Now he gives us another piece of information. Verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. Well, what are they? The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Now, as we think again of this inspired outline, you can see from the chart up here, that when one follows this outline, when one recognizes this outline, they are able to then properly understand and interpret the flow of the book of Revelation. In doing so, we keep in mind that this book was written to these very churches that are going to be mentioned in chapters 2 and 3. They are seven churches found in the area of Asia Minor, or modern-day Turkey today. And they have at least a threefold significance. First of all, they were actual historical local churches in Asia Minor. In other words, these are factual churches, not fictional. They're, they actually existed. This is not make-believe. He is writing a letter to those individuals who comprise those churches in those seven geographical locations, and they were the real deal. In fact, as you would look at them here, you can see from clockwise, it would go from Pergamus to Thyatira to Sardis to Smyrna, Philadelphia, Ephesus, and Laodicea, though that is not the order he will address them, as I'll point out in a little bit. And again, this is in modern-day Turkey, and these churches are largely the product of the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys, the preaching of the gospel, the teaching of sound doctrine, the planting of these churches, then reached out to other areas with the spreading of the gospel as well. The second aspect and significance of these seven churches is that they are symbolic. They are symbolic of types of churches that have existed and continue to exist today. You see, they are the things which are present tense. 
And there are seven in number, and seven in the Bible is the number of completion. And while there were many other churches besides seven, why did he choose seven? Because seven, again, gives us a composite of the kinds or types of churches that existed then and exist to this very day. And while I do not believe these seven churches reflect prophetically seven stages of church history, I do believe that these kinds of churches existed actually in the first century and that these types of churches have existed throughout the church age. Ephesian-type churches, Smyrna-type churches, Pergamus-type churches, Thyatira-type churches, Sardis-type churches, Philadelphia-type churches, Laodicea-type churches. And it is true that certain stages of church history may be more dominant in one of those kinds of churches than others. Like I believe personally, we are very Laodicea, at least in the United States of America, self-deceived, content with our external riches, and in so many cases, missing the boat. Lukewarm. But there's a third significance to these seven churches as well. Namely, they are representative of individual believers today. And we see that in each of them, there is an appeal to the individual. There is a commendation to the church, a criticism of the church, and then there's an appeal not only to the church, but to the individuals. Look at verse 7. Chapter 2, verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Notice this is a personal appeal. Look at verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Look at verse 20. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you always allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual morality and eat things sacrificed to idols and so forth and so forth. And then we pick it up and... Verse, uh, looking for the verse. Verse 29. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so there's these individual appeals. You know why? Because there are believers today that are reflective of these kind of churches. They are, are like Ephesus who have left their first love, or, or like Smyrna who are suffering for the Savior, or like Pergamus who are wedded to the world, or like Thyatira who are tolerating false doctrine, or like Sardis who is dead and dying, or like Philadelphia who are being used evangelistically with many open doors for the Lord, or they're like Laodicea, they're just lukewarm, and the Lord Jesus says, I want to vomit it right out of my mouth. There's individual believers like that. In fact, you may be one for a period of time in your life and then maybe something else later. Because the Christian life is not stagnant. It's dynamic. And you're either progressing or retrogressing. You do not stand still. When people say to me, I say, how are you doing? He says, well, I'm kind of coasting. I always say, have you ever seen anything coast uphill? And if you're coasting in your Christian life, you're slipping downhill. Because the Christian life involves what's between your two ears, what you're thinking, and therefore then what you are choosing, and those will have great ramifications in your life. Now, chapter 1 of Revelation introduces the book and has John record the things that you have seen that centers around the resurrected Christ with the seven stars in his hand walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands which represent the seven local churches that he's going to address. The second major <coughs> section of the book of Revelation is John writing down the things which are as it relates to these seven churches. This is a letter from Christ to these churches. 
It is a penetrating letter exposing what is really going on in each of these churches. You know, sometimes people think, I know everything that's going on around here. Sometimes I am the last person to find out. But I do know who knows what is really going on around here. The Lord Jesus Christ. It's not only a penetrating letter, it's a personal letter. It's written specifically with the strengths and weaknesses of each church in view. And it is a passionate letter in which Jesus Christ calls on five out of the seven churches to repent. Or else he would eventually remove their testimony for Jesus Christ in their geographical area. And if you don't think Jesus Christ was serious about it, what he said to these seven churches and their need to repent, you need to realize that in Turkey today, it is almost totally Muslim or secular with very few genuine Christian witnesses in these very seven cities that are mentioned right here because their lampstand has gone. Will this be true of our church? Will this be true of your life? Where will DBC be in five years, 10 years, 15 years? What about the next generation growing up right here? Will they make a difference for Christ? Will they know the Lord? Will they walk with him? Will they see the value of doctrine? Will they compromise with the world? Will they tolerate false teaching? You see, each generation has to make up their own mind. You have to decide what will become of your life and whether you will seek to honor Jesus Christ with what time you have or not. Because frankly, you are not promised even another day. Could be today, maybe your last. I was talking to someone in the hospital yesterday, dying of cancer, not even 50 years old. And I said to her, you know, as she asked, am I dying? And I said, you know, I'm not a doctor, but it doesn't look good. But in another sense, we're all terminal. And we're not guaranteed even another day because it's of his mercies that we're not concerned. And frankly, your times are in the Lord's hands. And I had a chance to just talk to her, encourage her, give her some perspective. And she was very positive. You see, we need to take what we're going to read today very, very seriously. Now, as Jesus Christ begins to evaluate each of these seven churches, he first of all evaluates the flagship church, the church of Ephesus, the church which was largely responsible for the planting of the other six churches in this area, the church in which Paul taught for three years in the school of Tyrannius, as recorded in Acts chapter 19, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks, Acts 19, verse 10. So the first thing we observe in this passage is that the church of Ephesus is a saved church. To the angel or messenger of the church, right. Now, who is the angel of the church? Well, the Greek word translated angel is our word angelos, in which we get the word messenger. It does not have to be an angel in contrast to a man. Some believe that it's an angel, an actual angel, which I personally find a little odd, you know, that some angel was sent to speak to the church, as it were. Uh, I think perhaps it's much better understood to be a human messenger, 
probably the pastor teacher, which by the way, the human messenger view is the most favored view by most commentators. It would be like the Lord giving me, as it were, a message to share with the whole church. And remember, there's seven stars, and my name is Rock Star, so I think there's a connection. But keep in mind that uh, unless the people in your church have been saved by the grace of God, you don't really have a church anyhow. You may have a religious stone quarry, but you don't have a church. You may actually have an emotional pep rally, but you really don't have a church. You may have a cycle babble session, but you really don't have a church. You may have what you call worship and do religious calisthenics, but you don't really have a church. You may have a Lonely Hearts Club where people socialize, wave their hands, and drink coffee, but you don't really have a local church. Unless the people have been born again and placed by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ. And you see, as you think of the concept of ecclesia, the church, it has both a, a, a universal sense and a local sense to it. For we think of the the universal church. We think of believers from the day of Pentecost to the rapture that are part of this church. But that universal church finds expression again in, in local churches as well. And that's who he's writing to. He's writing to the church of Ephesus right here, comprised of believers in Christ. And by the way, when you compare the universal church versus local churches, Local churches are mentioned 10 to 1 over universal church, or the universal church. Don't ever downplay the importance of a Christ-centered, Bible-believing assembly of believers called the local church, regardless of what spots and wrinkles exist therein. You know, as I've said before, if you ever find the perfect church, don't go there, you'll ruin it. And even when people have talked about moving to Duluth and being part of Duluth Bible Church, I always tell them, this is not Utopia Bible Church. You've got to have realistic expectations. Yes, it is a place where the Word of God is taught verse by verse. Yes, we seek to be oriented to grace. Yes, we seek to preach the gospel clearly. Yes, I love our church, but we have many spots and wrinkles starting with the pastor on down. But I sure do love you, and I love this local church. Sure, I'm thankful for this spiritual family of believers here. I was talking to a believer the other day, and she just said to me, just so thankful, again, to be part of a family of believers. All the one another's that go on. And I surely do recognize that by God's grace, we have done more together for Christ than we could have ever done alone. Don't take that for granted. You see, the church isn't the building, though we're thankful for our building. It's not even technically, first of all, an organization, though I'll comment on that in a moment. It's really the people. It's you as a believer in Christ and the believer in Christ next to you today, a community of believers as we are assembling together, we gather to worship and we scatter to evangelize. It's those who have been saved by the grace of God. It's those who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. It is those who have been baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ. That's what the church is all about. And again, we're... It all starts with faith in Christ. It starts by being saved. In fact, go back to Revelation 1 for a moment. You know, I had a funeral up on the Iron Range this week. It's always fun to go back to the range for me. You know, the range is a subculture in itself. If you ever lived on the range or visited, you know what? It, it's just got its own culture. And I understand that culture. And I lived there for years. 
And it's really, it was great to see a few believers I knew, as well as to give the gospel to those who I didn't. But you know, when you're in a senior citizen center, you don't have a PowerPoint or anything. You know, it's really nice to have a visual, and I, I, I use the Savanjikyu. And in doing so, I, 50 to 75 people had a great opportunity to explain again that, that God is holy and he's, he's without sin. <coughs> In contrast, there's none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the penalty for sin is death. And for us to go to heaven, we have to be without sin. This is the bad news. In fact, we all deserve to go to hell. But the good news is that God loved us, and he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for our sins and pay for them completely and cry out, it is finished, so that having died for all of our sins, the sin debt penalty being paid in full, that God could now offer to us salvation as a free gift. But to do so, Christ would have to get off the cross and out of the tomb in which he did, in which having been in the tomb for three days, as proof that he truly died, he then rose victorious from the grave which is proof that God accepted the payment made on our behalf and that now as a living, resurrected Savior, he could give us eternal life as a gift. And to do so, you must come God's way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's the gift of God, and it's not of works, lest anyone should boast. And you see, in Revelation chapter 1, if you look with me there at verse 5, well, we can start in, in verse 4. John, to the seven churches, which are in Asia Minor, that's what the letter is written to, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before the throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Now watch this. Here's the dedication of the letter. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You see, the price was paid to redeem us. But we either can accept this gift or we can reject it. And thus the issue is not ultimately the sin question, but the son question. What do we think of Christ? And remember, at the foot of the cross, the ground is really level. It doesn't matter if you're a moral sinner, an immoral sinner, or a religious sinner. A bad sinner, as it were, or a not-so-bad sinner. A sinner you are, and you come to Christ the very same way, and the ground is level at the cross. There's only one way. It's by grace. There's only one means. It's through faith. There's only one object of faith. It's He's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's believing he died for your sins and rose again, that you're washed then from your sins by his own blood. And you must come by faith to Christ. And the moment you do, you're not only saved from hell to heaven, you not only are given eternal life, you're not only redeemed, you not only become part of the family, you become part of the universal church. And you actually would now have a reason to gather together with other believers in Christ, to worship the Lord, to grow, to serve, and do more for Christ together than you could alone. You see, that's what the church is all about. It's about people. Saved by God's grace. Is that true of you? Have you ever been saved? Do you know for sure if you die, you're going to go to heaven? Is your faith in Christ alone or not? Now, Ephesians also tells us, even as we think of the priorities and purpose of the local church, that we want to obviously honor the Lord in what we do, but it all starts again with evangelism, people getting saved, and then edification, them getting spiritually built up and getting them equipped so for their work of ministry. 
And God gives grace in order for this to happen. You see, it's in the local church that believers are to be edified and not entertained. It is in the local church that the saints are to be equipped for the work of ministry God has for them in their families and in their jobs and in their communities and beyond. It's in the local church where the one and others occur. It's in the local church where your spiritual gifts are developed and used. It's in the local church where so many relationships are developed around the Lord and his word. It's in the local church where fellowship with other believers of like precious faith happens, though it's not limited to one local church. And while the local church is a spiritual organism, it's not without structural, functional, organizational model. Again, we recognize the Lord Jesus Christ as the head of the church. He's given to us his word, and in doing so, he's also given to us elders or pastors or leaders to feed and lead his flock, and in doing so, he's given deacons to assist to accomplish that objective and to a spiritually gifted congregation. And while the New Testament models a plurality of godly leaders, it doesn't mandate it. You see, you have as many elders in a church as God gives you. Otherwise, you may appoint unqualified men to be elders to meet some unscriptural quota, and I've heard of churches that do that. And every member of the body is to do his or her share in love, to serve one another for the growth of the body. And this is why the New Testament knows nothing of lone wolf, lone ranger believers who stiff arm the local church when a doctrinally sound church is available, which isn't always the case. You know, I know some believers who lived in Montana, who live in Montana. You know, for years they watched the webcaster. And they were so thankful for it. But they found a church 60 miles away that was doctrinally sound. And now they're making the drive. They're not watching the webcast anymore because they saw along the valley of the local church but didn't have access. 60 miles away. And they say, well, that's Montana. They drive 100 miles an hour. That's only 30 minutes. <laughs> but they see the valley. They got the point. You know, I was talking to someone not long ago who left a doctrinally sound church over a non-doctrinal reason and a non-moral reason, and now a year later has no church and has no pastor and has no direction. And I said to him, are you really better off? And you see, that's what happens when you make unprincipled decisions over oftentimes emotional or personal things. And inevitably, so what happens then is people strain at a personal gnat and they swallow a doctrinal camel and they go somewhere else and they tolerate what they would have never tolerated the church they left. Boy, we can be goofy, can't we? So goofy. When you're not thinking biblically and you're just operating on emotions, you are going to make an unprincipled decision. And when it's all said and done, you will not be better off. And a lot of times there's some serious consequences. And sometimes they say, no, what we're going to do, we're going to form our own church. And so they get together, they're going to form their own church. And it's partly a reaction of where they came from. You know what? Churches do not get established and grow and form over reactions. It's not what you're against. You've got to be what you're for. And you've got to be truly led of the Lord in all of this. Otherwise, you just think, we can make this thing work. We're going to hustle and hustle and hustle. And we'll make it work. And then 10 years later, there's nothing left. Why? Because the whole foundation was wrong to begin with. And you know, when it's all said and done, and you have to go back and evaluate, did it really benefit the cause of Jesus Christ? And that's why I've said, you know, again, we have spots and wrinkles. You know, the most people who leave this church do not ever leave for doctrinal reasons. They're just bugged about something. And you know, I read these verses like Colossians 3. In fact, let's go there. I'm off script anyhow. Let's go there. 
Colossians 3. Now here's a verse to put in your pipe and smoke for this year. Colossians 3. Verse 12. Now he's speaking to the whole church in this section. He says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Notice that's all towards other people. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Why don't we put that on our refrigerators? And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. You know, I had to tell a believer recently, I had to say to him, in light of the grace of God shown toward us and the unconditional love, if there's any people on the planet that should be able to show grace to someone else and unconditional love, in spite of whatever's transpired in the past, it should be believers in Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying there's never a place to leave a church. And I'm not saying everyone who's left the Luth Bible Church is carnal. I don't know where they're at. I just know the biblical blueprint, though. And I know what the principle is. And I know that God, this is the way God designed this thing to work. And I'm very thankful for our local church and what God has done. 2017 was a difficult year in some years, I do, in some respects at DBC. We had some peaks and we had some valleys. Boy, but where else would I be? You know, I was talking to a, a man who was a pastor, then he got involved in the parachurch, and now he's a pastor again. And this is what he said to me. As he was taking over a local church again, he goes, Dennis, I'm on the front lines again. And while I'm thankful wherever the word of God is taught in truth and wherever the gospel is preached, I recognize that the parachurch, if it does not serve to further the purposes of the local church, but actually hinders them, actually becomes a parasite instead of a benefit. They become a competitor to the local church instead of a contributor. They take our people and money and then criticize the local church for not doing the job. Now, don't misunderstand me here. I support, we support certain parachurch organizations, like Good Seed International, or Seward Siemens Mission, or Grace Global Radio. As long as they are doctrinally sound and help further the cause of Christ and don't compete, as it were, with the local church. In fact, I have some very good friends who serve in parachurch ministries and who even teach at Duluth Bible during the Fall Bible Conference. But keep in mind the local church, according to the plan of God, is where it is at. In fact, we've likened it time to the golden goose that lays the golden eggs. That golden goose is the local church. And in, prim in, in primary emphasis, the gathering together as we do on Sunday and Wednesday with our Sunday school and Kids for Christ and all these other things. And coming out of this come things like missions or fair evangelism or other kinds of but you know what? If the goose isn't healthy, the eggs aren't going to happen. Got to have a healthy goose. In fact, someone said once that sheep reproduce best that when they're healthy. So true. So true. You know, because of the importance of the local church, we read in Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know, it's so easy to get sloppy about this. I was talking to a believer recently, and he says to me, he says, you know, 
I just got caught up with the cares of the world, and then I just got stuck in a rut. That's why you haven't seen me for a while. Do you forsake the public assembling of yourselves with other believers? Well, you're not automatically spiritual because you go to Duluth Bible Church or you come to church. Well, that's true. I mean, is that not true? <laughs> On the other hand, you're not automatically spiritual because you stay home either. And furthermore, when you are walking with the Lord and you're enjoying Jesus Christ, don't you want to be around other believers? Don't you want to hear the word of God? Don't you want to worship together with others? Well, you would be here with bells on if you're thinking right. But when you're not, then you just kind of slink into your corner and do your own thing so often. As the manner of some is, by the way, you know, I'm convinced at times that believers come in here carnal, walk out spiritual. Because they came and they heard the word of God and they got encouraged and they got refocused and they got recalibrated and they're walking out of here. And though they had to take sides against their flesh to come and they didn't maybe feel like it, but they came anyhow and they heard the word of God whatever, and they walked out just encouraged, refocused, enjoying the Lord again. The Lord knows we need this. Do you see the value of assembling? In fact, as we think of the importance of the local church, it is central to the plan of God in this present dispensation. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, a metaphor for the church, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. You know, Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. You know, I love that verse. It's his church, and he's going to build it. He never asked me to build it. He asked me as a pastor teacher, among with the other pastors, to preach the word and shepherd his flock faithfully, pointing people to his sufficiency. But he's the one who's going to build it. And did you realize he's building his church today? He's not setting up his kingdom. And that this church project is central to the plan of God. And that the Great Commission finds ultimate fulfillment in not merely preaching the gospel, not only people getting saved, not only believers being publicly identified through baptism, not only in teaching them, but ultimately then in local churches that perpetuate this in their geographical location so that others are reached and other churches are planted and the gospel continues to go on and on. In fact, as I mentioned recently, did you realize that the greatest act of divine discipline for the believer in the New Testament, right below being taken home early through a premature death, is to be disciplined out of the local church. That's how important it is. And yet there are believers today who just walk away as if it's no big deal. So first of all, I'm finally getting to point two. The church of Ephesus was a saved church, as there really is no other kind. But secondly, the saved church was a significant, in a significant city. It was the church of Ephesus, right. It was a strategic location. You see it right there on the map. It was located near the mouth of the Castor River, only three miles from the coast, and it became the capital of Asia Minor. It was connected by highways with the interior of Asia and all her chief cities and became a great commercial center. It was a great religious center with the worship of Diana, which, by the way, I'm amazed. You know, I was, I was uh, flying back from Africa. And, you know, you're sitting in this plane from Air France, and and it has a lot of different options, and you can watch videos, you know, and things. And I was bored, you know, and uh, punched in Wonder Woman. <laughs> Wonder what this is about. And I started watching Wonder Woman. By the way, do you know what her name was? Diana. 
And she was supposedly a god. This is just like the Ephesians. Remember, they for three, great is Diana. They kept worshiping her. And this is exactly where the Lord starts the church. In Ephesus, in this strategic city. And you know, as I thought of the church of Ephesus and I thought of DBC, I couldn't help but think of some parallels. Uh, in Ephesus was founded by the Apostle Paul in, in about 53, 51, 52 AD, second missionary journey. How Paul ministered there for three years at the school of Tyrannius, impacting the whole region for Jesus Christ. By the way, he stayed there longer than any other place. How the epistle to the Ephesians was written around 62 AD. How Paul's ministry was followed by Timothy later. And when he writes First and Second Timothy, that's where Timothy is. How the apostle John later ministered at Ephesus. I mean, just think of the teachers they had. Paul, Timothy, John, wow. That's some great Bible teachers. And Revelation 2 is written about 90 to 95 AD, approximately 40 years after its founding. And I think a case could be made for some parallels the Church of Ephesus in DBC. Uh, it was started as a Bible study by Pastor Leonard Radke of Heritage Trail Bible Church in 1973. In fact, you know last December 5th was 35 years ago that he died at the age of 52. No, don't ask me why God took him home at the age of 52 and at the height of his ministry. I don't know. I know God buries his workmen but continues his work. I know that God never asked me to be all-knowing. He asked me to trust him. Like Abel in Hebrews 11, for he being dead yet speaks. And you know, God doesn't always give us explanations. He gives us promises. And he did what he did. DBC became an official independent church and 1982, again, planted, as it were, from Heritage Trail Bible Church. So thankful for their ministry and their prayers and their fellowship and their camps over the years and such. I began teaching in the fall of 81 with a high, squeaky voice and bold legs. Became the pastor teacher in 85. Our first Bible conference began in 86 with Pastor Jay Chapel. Gibbs began in 92. We purchased this, this building in 1994. Kind of like the School of Tyrannians. And here, as I think of even the teaching over the years, we've really been privileged to have some, just some tremendous teachers, have we not? Even at our fall Bible conference, Dr. Reynolds Showers, Dr. John Whitcomb, Chet McCauley, Ron Merriman, Andy Woods, Rich McCarroll, Randall Price, and many, many others. And by the way, the Bible conference this year, first week of October. You know, as I think of that, we've seen elders, deacons, full-time staff persons, new ministries develop out of BBC. Pete Tranvik went to Claressa Bible Church. He's now at Vistosa Community Church. Sean went to Itasca Bible. Dave went to Grace Gospel Bible Church. Tom Stiegel went to Word of Grace and then was followed there by Rick Gerhardt's and so forth. We realize that missionary outreaches have happened since the year 2000 in El Salvador, followed by Myanmar, Trinidad, Guyana, Kazakhstan, India, Zambia, Kenya, Liberia, Nicaragua, the Gambia, Peru, and who knows where next. We know that the publication ministry expanded in 2012 with Tom Stiegel becoming its full-time publications director. We know that Gibbs Connected began this year, and whatever has been done, it's been done by the grace of God, not by legalistic pressure. Whatever has been accomplished has been, been done, hopefully, through the power of the Holy Spirit and not cranked out in the flesh. And it's involved many, many believers serving together and sacrificing their time and money to invest in Jesus Christ, the Word of God, and people. And we focused on a clear presentation of the gospel, teaching sound doctrine in a clear, accurate, practical, and simple manner, not through ear-tickling <coughs> preaching. 
Not cotton candy preaching. Not to felt needs, but to real needs. But not without times of heartache, peaks and valleys, pluses and minuses. And keep in mind that when Jesus Christ evaluates this church at Ephesus, right what we're reading, it's approximately 40 years old, just like DVC. And I fear. What happened at Ephesus is happening here at DBC. For the bottom line is not the appraisal of man, but the approval of Jesus Christ. Because you see, he's the supreme critic, isn't he? Look at verse 1 with me again. So we go back to Revelation 1, or 2, and verse 1. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. You see, he's the critic. He's the one who's watching. He's the one who's evaluating. What would Jesus Christ say about DBC? What would Jesus Christ say about you and me? You see, he's the one who holds the seven stars, the messengers, in his right hand. He's the one who's walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. These things says he, the unique God-man, the savior of the world, the head of the church. And you see, as we think of even him holding the seven stars in his right hands, it speaks of his authority. It speaks of his preservation. You see, he's the head of the church, not a pope, not a priest, and not a pastor. The issue is not what do the people want. The issue is what does he want? What honors him? What does he approve of? What does he think of Duluth Bible? And by the way, each of these seven churches gave an individual account to him. They were all independent. They were all autonomous. They're all under Christ's headship. There is no denomination here or anywhere else in the Bible. And he's the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. He keeps them safe. He keeps them protected. He keeps them secure. And he is the one who is walking in the midst of these seven churches golden lampstands, which refers to his active ministry and presence. Keep in mind, he is omnipresent. Though he's seated at the right hand of God regarding his sacrifice for sin, we know he's also standing at times to receive people like Stephen when they've been martyred. He's walking in the midst of local churches in an active ministry and presence. And he says also, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, when it comes to our witness for Christ. So he's omnipresent, but he's also omniscient. He knows everything that is and is not happening in our local church. He knows everything below the surface. He not only knows the actions, he knows the attitudes. He not only knows the methods, but he knows the motives. And what a good description a lampstand of a local church. What are we to be? We're to be a bright light in Duluth and in this region for Christ in a dark world. And here's Jesus Christ. He's walking in the midst of that. Do you know he is present here today? And he was here on time. <laughs> He's observing what is going on by way of the singing and the reading and the praying and the giving, the teaching. The, he's observing all of this. He's observing how and why it's going on. Is it according to the word of God? Is it for the glory of God? Is it a rod of the spirit of Christ? Are we just playing church? Are we just going through the motions and we were hungry and we thought we'd come to a potluck? Or are we just on autopilot? He's observing not only the external, he's observing 
the internal. And he's going to make evaluations. And he's going to commend them for many things. But he's also going to seriously criticize this church. He loves the church at Ephesus, just like he loves us. And he accepts us in Christ. That's our position. But in our condition, he will say to this church, you have one thing I have against you. And it's so important, and it's so fatal, and it's so significant that unless you repent, I'm going to blow the lampstand out. You have left your first love. By the way, does anyone who's married like to be the second love? You've left your first love. Who's our first love? the Lord Jesus Christ. And we love him because he first loved us. You see, they kept busy. Everything kept going on. But the vertical was breaking down. There was dry rot going on in hearts. They got so used to doing it, they could do it in their sleep. But where was their walk with the Lord? Where was their abiding? Where was this love relationship? Even you have left your first love, that screams of relationship, not performance of love, your first love. What is it or who is it you love? You know, when you love football, you, it's not hard to turn the TV set on or watch it on the internet. Even if you brace yourself, and it's the Vikings. They left their first true of you. That's true of me. It's so easy to get busy, isn't it? That we just break down in our personal fellowship with the Lord. I have a lot more to say about this, but we'll wait till Wednesday. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the church at Ephesus. And the lessons you want to teach us through this local church. That in many ways is probably like Duluth Bible Church. Though you ultimately know. And we're thankful, Father, for this local church. Thank you full because in many cases... It was through believers from here. We heard the gospel and we were saved, established. And we know many people have been saved over the years. And we're very grateful for that. We know the word of God has gone out in many ways. And to you be the glory. But we also know it's not Utopia Bible. We've had ups and downs. We openly confess that we have many spots and wrinkles. And we know that if those adjustments are going to be made that are needed, that we can't afford to leave our first love. And we know that when we leave our first love, that this then ripples down into all kinds of other things. And eventually to the just destruction, as it were, of the testimony of that local church, of our local church. And we know we're not the only church, and there's believers in all kinds of different churches. We're just thankful, again, wherever the gospel's being preached in truth. But Father, we just thank you for this special community of believers here. And we want to take this to heart. We don't want to have the spiritual yawns. We don't want to go into another year only to play church or stay busy or Think we're spiritual because we're doing something instead of truly relating to you. I pray, Father, that you would direct not only with taking to heart what was said in this study, but in our next as well. In doing so, Father, I pray that we would be spiritual Marys and not carnal Marthas. I pray that we'd realize 
the importance of the vertical first before the horizontal. I pray that we would even have an enjoyable time of fellowship at the potluck here to follow and even the service that would then be had following. I just want to thank you again for, for who you are and what you've done. And I just want to especially thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for paying for our sins on the cross. And thank you that through your blood our sins can be washed away the moment we put our trust in Christ alone, in you alone. And Father, if there's anyone here who's never been saved, I pray that right now they would realize it's not a matter of repenting from their sins, though they may have many. It's not a matter of asking Jesus into their heart, though he comes in when we believe. It's not a matter of saying the sinner's prayer. It's a matter of, of trusting. And the only Savior he ever provided in believing the gospel, that he died for our sins and rose again and receiving as a gift, all the blessings you offer to us in Christ, including a change in our destiny. And we know then we truly have a, a reason to gather with other believers because we're going to spend eternity together. Wow. And so direct with our fellowship the remainder of the day, and thank you again now in Jesus' name.